Here we go. Tell me your name, your age if you're comfortable, where do you live, and what is your art form? Um, my name is Nima Nabavi. I'm 45 years old. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I live, I'm in Roswell right now. I was living in Dubai before I came to Roswell. And from Roswell, I'm going to New York, so everywhere usually. And my art form, I would say geometric abstraction is as close as it gets to mm -hmm. describing it. It seems so. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the first question is, tell me a point of inspiration in your life that has greatly influenced your creative life. This could be anything. It can be a person, a thought, a piece of artwork, a piece of music, anything that has that is a touchstone for you in your creative life. Mm. It's a story I tell a lot, but you know, um, my chief inspiration for even making any kind of geometric work was that my grandfather used to make this kind of work when I was young. Um, he had retired early. They sold a company, him and his brother, that made sign products in Iran um, in the 50s and 60s. And when he retired, he focused entirely on making art, geometric abstraction. But his pursuit of the, the art was never, was never for commercial reasons. And it didn't even seem like it was very much um, concerned with kind of an aesthetic uh, direction where he wasn't making this work necessarily to be hung on people's wall, but he was making work, it seemed, because of deep um, research and curiosity. And so my memory of him was him always sitting and drawing these lines in very similar uh, formations to what I'm doing now. And his pursuit of order and his enthusiasm for um, trying to figure out the why and the how of all these things. He used to always say to us that like the whole universe is in these grids. And it was, it was very intense, his, his passion for it. So I never made work like this at any other point in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I never really made work before I was 38 years old. Six, seven years ago, out of curiosity, thinking about my grandfather, I. I remembered a few of the ways he described to me how certain grids can create certain forms. And just out of curiosity, I started um, drawing my own formations and grids in order. Um, and I just got super drawn into it. And, then, and I think because there was always that um, path left by him where I knew that these things could get very deep, very aesthetically pleasant, very um, satisfying to make. I, I kind of knew what direction I was going into, and I knew that um, his intensity for the work, his, uh, his ability to sit and work on it the entire day and not say any other thing, it's all he worked on was, was this. So mm -hmm. having had that model in my mind as a, as a blueprint for intensity, and a um, welcome uh, disposition towards uh, taking on lots of work mm -hmm. and knowing that with complexity, the beauty increases or that the intensity of the work increases. So I think when I, he is my biggest inspiration for making geometric art. His work was all around me as I grew up. I, really got drawn into, even if it was un unconsciously, I was drawn into, you know, you're a kid and you're looking at these drawings or paintings or, 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 or whatever artworks that are very geometric, very ordered, very complex, but as a kid you're looking at this thing every day of your life as you sit on the couch and you can see, oh yeah, those things connect, these things connect, that's how that, you know, and, and so having these things around even more than I realized did influence the way I kind of understood patterns and the orders and the rules and how by following certain rhythms, certain emergent properties um, reveal themselves. So uh, yeah, 100% I think um, my grandfather's is um, really the biggest 
biggest inspiration for my life. Mm, that's a wonderful um, recounting of lineage and ancestry and mm. and how interesting that it uh, it it did not uh, present in you until mm -hmm. later in life. Yeah. Only in its time, right? I yeah. think with these things that uh, that germinate yeah. early on. Um, yeah, and I think when you're younger, you don't necessarily realize that this is a special thing. Mm -hmm. And as you get older and see the significance of it and realize that you're also in a position to understand these things, I don't know why, but the work doesn't feel, it's never been difficult for me mm -hmm. in trying to, um, a lot of people are like, how do you even know what you're going to do next? Well, I mean, I don't know, but to me it's quite simple. It's like I'm working on this part, then I'll work on that. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I see these things in a particular way. Obviously it comes with a lot of practice, but it is that when you see someone in your lineage, in your family, in the group of people that you know doing a thing, and then so you know that thing is possible. Mm -hmm. And I think just that knowing that something is possible and it's possible by someone with the same genetic makeup as you as well. Like, and so like knowing, just knowing that it's possible allows you to do it. So I think that, um, yeah, that's that's the interesting way, way thing about how uh, it presents itself later in life is that you really do start to understand that your skills aren't just what you've trained on, but things that have been in your environment as well. Yes, yes, and that leads directly in a very lovely way into the second question, and we're I'm just flashing down here to this piece, which is enormous and has taken you a year to make. Yes. Um, this brings me into the process mm -hmm. um, question that I ask, which is when, and obviously this is very exacting work, mm -hmm. but when you are in the process of creating your work and things are going well, whatever that means, you mm -hmm. know, the struggle is less, maybe you're less uh, mentally occupied. Is there a particular, have you been aware through, through the years that you've been making art and specifically on this piece, where there is a particular body sensation that takes over and I, you know, each artist, uh, each creative person that I interview describes this in a different way because, you know, obviously musicians are, you know, playing, mm. you're making, writers are writing and so forth. But when the active critical mind is uh, falls away, what does that feel like in the body center for you, Nima? I think that there are times, for instance, when I was putting down this final white layer on top of this, it's what defines a lot of the structural elements. So many things have been laid on top of each other. So it is interesting at the very end of 30 layers, what you decide the final layer will be. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that it's not, it, it does get it to a point where I'm just doing, I'm just responding to, oh, I should do these. And then I do this part and I get up on the ladder and look down and go, oh, you want me to do like, it really does feel like, there's a point at which I, and I don't mean it to sound overly dramatic, but it's just that it's kind of like an equation that, or something of that form where it starts indicating to you, like, this part now needs to be covered, and then you do that, and it's like, like, elongate these parts. Like, you know, like, it really does feel that somehow between me in the piece, there is some discussion of like, this is what needs to get done next. And, and honestly, a lot of times it gets very difficult to uh, let go because there are points at which, and you've seen, there's been points at which for six months that this piece has been basically done. And it's just not like, it just seems to me that there's always another thing that needs to be done or four more things that need to be done. Let me get to that. And so now I'm so close 
that I don't know if there's one or two more things that need to be done or nothing that needs to be done. So this is also, you know, to, to bring it back to your question is that with work like this, because there's nothing inherently better about um, the center being more yellow as opposed to more white or the, that there should be, some people come in and say, I, I really like it when everything is under the color. Some people mm -hmm. like, so, and it's geometry and there is no correct mm -hmm. finishing point. Mm -hmm. It's just that there has to be this kind of um, tension between me and the piece where, not even tension, but it's kind of like, do you need <laughs> something right. else? Should, am I, do I need to put something else down? Is this the state that we finish in? And so, I would say that there is this automatic feeling mm -hmm. when I was just the other night, like the final real day of working on the white lines, there wasn't a lot of like, let me stand back. It was like, well, this part's done now that, okay, now these parts, okay, now, and so you're just responding to it and moving. And I think that, you know, I'm sure people talk about a flow state. Mm -hmm. um, there is that, but there is also, um, some type of mental tension too, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I'm trying to make sense of mm -hmm. who, who's directing what and at what point I can say, like today, can I just say, it's totally done and it is what it is? Or will I, there's a very good chance that as soon as you leave, that I'm gonna start adding stuff to it, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. it might just be, during this conversation, as I'm looking at it and talking to you, that either I come to terms with this is actually it, or it's not. And so that there is, I don't know if it speaks directly to what you're saying, but I do think that there is kind of a uh, interaction. Um, and I don't think that once it gets to a certain point, um, I'm not making a ton of personal choices. Right, yes. Your choices are limited. You're being drawn in certain directions. You can all, you know, like I can't, now I can't change the color orientation of this, no right. matter what I do. I can add a little thing there, a little thing, but like really I've locked in all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. So the piece really does direct a lot of things. Um, but also after, when the work is done and I'm looking at it, that also is like, there is a feeling of certain like peace and looking at certain parts of it and, and the symmetry looking comfortable and things looking very, so there is a lot of this feeling of, I know that this is going in the right direction. This is good. So all the positive things are happening, but I think towards the end, as like the choices are dwindling down and it's kind of coming to a point of like, this is gonna finish at the point at which it finishes and that's kind mm -hmm. of it. But like, so I, I do think there's kind of this funny loss of tension towards it, mm -hmm. loss of control towards the end, um, where you are working with smaller and smaller possibilities. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, I think that getting to that very final point has this funny automatic working, mm -hmm. Um, plus questioning and beginning to like like this kind of that kind of tension and comfort <laughs> yes. in, a, in a nice enough bubble that I, I I'm never sad working on the piece I'm always just wondering and questioning right um, and then also contemplating whether I really have that much control yes it's interesting what you're talking about because um, in a piece like this that is so long, it's long form, yeah. right? Is that, and I've experienced this as a writer, is that there's a certain point where the book knows itself. Yeah. And is kind of at times dictating to how it will proceed, but you have to get into it to a certain point over a year where, where the characters almost drive you. And I can imagine another way of saying what you're saying, and not to not not to put words in your mouth, but it is a conversation that the piece is telling you to a great degree at a certain point yeah. what more it needs. 
Yeah. You know? And I think in the, in the beginning, you can set the path. I knew from the beginning yes. this is going to be a gradient from yellow to blue. Uh, I knew there's, once you place this shape in the middle, there's, you're limiting possibility. So it's not to say that, oh, this piece existed and I have nothing to do with it. No, you, you direct it a lot. Of course, of course. But then at certain points, it really, I think you do develop this um, reverence for the work where, uh, you know, like, honestly, I think that uh, I hang around the work sometimes. It's like a relationship. Yeah, yeah. I'll meditate <laughs> on the piece, or I'll sit here at night sometimes. In the very beginning, when I first was here, like, I would have my dinner here, and I'd sit, and I'd just contemplate a lot. So there, so there is that. I really do think that, especially with this kind of work, that there's no technical guidebook to mm -hmm. kind of how and why these things should look in a particular way. They're, may, I don't know, but maybe if you're painting a sunset, maybe they've decoded the technicalities of that mm -hmm. and say like, these are the ways that it can be done um, and what's good and bad or whatever. But I think with, with a lot of like geometric work, it, I also wonder what I'm wondering. I wonder what I w will. Is it nicer if it does this thing here and not there, or is it nice? Like it's hard to understand what would make it nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Pure aesthetics. Yeah, right? it's, it's a very, or, or, or that once you get to a certain level of complexity. Yeah. Um, there's diminishing returns on the wows. Right. So like there is this trying to figure out what is the appealing thing about this anyways and how to accentuate it. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I do think that in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation with a lot of unknowns. Right. And I think it's that trying to figure that out and also not trying to not take it so seriously also, mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, just do the work that needs to be done it, and, and just uh, respect the work that you're also making so that when it does speak, there, there was a point the other night where I'm like, I can't say that like, it's, I don't think that the piece is ending at like the ultimate final point of like beauty. I think that there's seven or eight points along the way that someone could have picked and said, oh, I like how like, the color was here, I like how the white lines were here. Um, so, so it is much more about this is where we landed. Mm -hmm. This is where you took me, this is where we got to. I made some decisions, you directed me in some ways, and mm -hmm. this is where we got to in the time that we had. And it is what it is. You right. know? So, and then also being able to let go of that, um, that you're not. There is no ultimate in a lot of this work. Yeah. You know, so that that's also a difficult thing to at some point just realize that the work is done. Yeah. And then that's it. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, the third question is um, kind of an up. Well, it's there's obvious answers, but each each creative person that I interview has a different take on it. Um, we all know art is important, all art forms. Mm -hmm. For you, why do we need art in this world? Why is it essential? Um, well, I mean, there's so many ways. For you personally, well, and the global thing, of course. I think that, um, for me personally, I'll say that I, I think that It's fun. I like making fun things. I like making beautiful things. I like when people say, wow, I think that that's always so interesting to me that there is, a, it still exists even in this fairly cynical, outwardly cynical um, expression that a lot of people take. Or not even cynical, but overwhelmed with, with content and 
um, so much passing through that there is, you know, when this piece was at the museum and I w was working on it, I'd see people walk in and just say, wow. And so I was like, oh, I like, I like that that still exists and that people are like, oh, cool. Oh, you did this? That's cool. Like, I do like that, um, you know, hundreds of people visited me at the museum. Everyone was so lovely and so respectful. And so people really dig this stuff. There's something happening. I think when we talk about art and we think of it as like, oh, I go to the museum and I very quietly read the, the name of the artist and I nod my head. Like, that's not art so much as like, there are these things that, um, like the other day I was thinking, it's funny that there's like, there's people that make the world run and then there's people that make the world fun. <laughs> <laughs> and and I really do believe that and I think that the, the motivation for creating a world that runs is that it it allows people to do fun things as well so there needs mm -hmm. to be fun things to be done mm -hmm. and and that's one of the, the triumphs I think besides all the obvious problems in, in human civilization but one of the triumphs is we are as a, we did get to a point where a big chunk of the population is creating entertainment as a reward for everyone else to mm -hmm. keep a functional system. And I really do think that that's true. I really do think that without movies and music and art and things like that, like um, if the world didn't have these fun elements, I don't think the motivation of Capitalism alone is enough to make someone go to work. I think that people <laughs> do a lot of, other than feeding themselves because we've gotten to a point in civilization where people could feed themselves and stay alive. But at mm -hmm. some point, people got into having fun. So there is this funny element that like we've created all this like cultural fun activity stuff that's a whole other segment of the economy. And so uh, I'm not saying it's good or bad that these things are motivations for anything or whatever, but I do think it is part of the human experience that we are enjoying mm -hmm. or ostensibly enjoying our experience. And I think a lot of the reasons why people make sacrifices every day is because they want to have an enjoyable experience. And unfortunately, the truth is that a lot of people go to work from 9 to 5 so that they can get home and have that 5 to 10 as their time to watch shows, go to museums, mm. laugh at a comedy thing. You know, like mm -hmm. I think that I'm not advocating for it being good or bad, but I do think these things that make the world fun are the bright spot of people's days, mm. one way or the other. Um, I'm not saying that this is important in any way. Honestly, most of the time I, when I'm working on it, I think it's funny that this is very, very unimportant in the scheme of this isn't helping get food into anyone's mouths other than my own, you know, like there, it isn't like helping the world run in any way. It's just like a beautiful thing alongside the way the world runs. So I do think it's funny that it's a needless thing that we do, but it's also admirable that we are at a point in, in human existence where we are just doing things because they're enjoyable to do and they're enjoyable to show someone else like like people that do magic tricks you know that's what's the point there's no point it's just to make someone say wow and so i think like in that sense um i think what makes it so amazing is that it is frivolous and but it's um like a frivolity that's done with so much skill because humans have like um moved forward on this type of creativity and we really respond to creativity and I still see that like um, if someone sees my work and they're also uh, intense craftsmen they get like they get a real kick out of it you know like engineers get a real kick out of it architects get a real you know like they'll get a smirk on their face so I think that yeah I don't know if I've, I've said it well, but I just think there's something interesting about um, doing things just to make the human experience more enjoyable for yes. us all. Sure. It's kind of where 
my feeling about art is in that zone. I that is interesting that we get the job of making things pretty or making things fun. Right. Well, well put. Yeah, thank you so much. Nima, thank you so much you. for sharing your creative imperative. It's been a joy. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah.